So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that um, to, to be accepted to present a paper to the Caribbean International Tourism Conference. And I'm happy to share some of my learning, some of my findings with my colleagues, and to encourage, hopefully to encourage colleagues to join us in our research agenda. Okay. Now, uh, this is actually a discussion about the performance, the rationale for, and the performance of public-private partnerships in the hotel sector. I come from chartered surveying, I'm a surveyor, and I have a very detailed way to look at things, and how we analyze things, and hotels are one of the things we analyze. The typical rationale for a public-private partnership that we're familiar with is one that talks about sharing risk, both parties to the arrangement benefiting. There's a degree of transparency and oversight so that all parties can see the performance of the relevant obligations, yes? And of course, the public-private partnership is very favored in these times because it allows you to recruit capital in a way that the, pu the public sector may not be able to recruit capital for particular projects. Well, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a different model taking place. Because what has happened in Trinidad and Tobago is that the three largest hotels in the country, and they're much larger than the other hotels, considerably larger, and I'll go into detail in them, are all state-owned. So in fact, the state recruited the capital. So it's a reversal of the typical understanding of how a public-private partnership is structured and how it's arranged. So in fact, in Trinidad and Tobago, it's public land and public money was used to design and construct and to fit and to furnish the hotels. And respectively, they are the Trinidad Hilton, which was built in 1962. The Magdalena Grand in Tobago, which was opened as Tobago Hilton in the year 2000. And Hyatt Regency in Port of Spain, which was opened in January of 2008. And those hotels represent a considerable investment of public capital. Now, the way public capital is measured in the discourse, we very seldom, and it's our fault, we, have, we can't blame anybody else, we are the commentators, we are the critics, we are the intellectuals, we very seldom mention the value of the land. It's almost a reflection, philosophically, of the environmental crisis. We measure everything except the land. So when you talk about projects, we talk about a project that's 400 million and that one is 300 million. And what we're actually speaking about is the construction contract. We are silent on the land and we are reaping the consequences. I'm talking as somebody coming from the profession of the land. We are silent on the land. And all of the projects, when you hear the discourse about it, it's always the construction project they're talking about. They never talk about the value of the land. And that has to be fixed if we have to have a better discourse going forward. The discussion, the research took place in two limbs. And I applied a variety of approaches to analyze the material. The first limb, because in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a Freedom of Information Act, which in other parts of the world is called an Access to Information Act. And I am one of the people who uses it a lot, quite successfully. Well, in this case, I wasn't successful, because we asked certain things. So the first limb of inquiry was the Freedom of Information Act. In other words, our lawful rights under the law in Trinidad and Tobago are to get information held by official bodies. Because all of that information in there and all of the money they spend is our money. They are conducting our business. And they ought to answer our questions. Well, in fact, in relation to the hotels in Trinidad and Tobago, they don't answer questions. What were the questions? The questions were, what are the management arrangements? What are the management agreements for these hotels? Because the way the public-private partnership is structured in the Trinidad and Tobago model, we take the land, we design, construct, fit, and furnish in accordance with the international hotel standards and specifications, and then we let them run the hotel under what is either called an operatorship lease or a management agreement. We hand them the keys for a newly built complex. Nobody wanted to disclose the management agreements. See, we live in a republic where everybody is supposed to be equal, but not really, okay? Nobody wanted to disclose that. And when I went further, because it's not just one thing I asked, 
I want to know what is the performance of the hotel. What is its turnover? What's its average gross operating profit? What's its wages? Repairs and maintenance. Its employment policies. Its promotion policies. All of the cogent, relevant questions that colleagues here would be cogitating on to talk about the sector. They don't want to answer those questions either. So in fact, all of them are very successful litigant under the Freedom of Information Act. In relation to this matter, I wasn't successful. And I never went to court. I did, I did take it up in a legalistic way with lawyers, and so we never went to court. I didn't have enough money to go to court. Fortunately, you see, the interesting thing in this type of work, eh? you think that people aren't listening, and you think it isn't having an effect, and sometimes you feel as if you're bouncing your head against a wall, and then sometimes beautifully, against all odds, a little ray of sunshine will shine through the clouds. And a young senator, who at the moment is in opposition, no doubt if they go into government, he would change his ways. But a young senator, who at the moment is in opposition, asked some questions that were very much like the questions I was asking. I'll just say his name, Senator Taka Obika. <laughs> and Taka asked the question, what are the taxes paid by these three hotels? And then he went further and asked, what are the dividends earned by the three hotels? And of course, there's a fundamental commitment to, to, to not answering the questions and not dealing with the truth. But then there's also a parliamentary tradition. <coughs> and a lot of these countries are anxious to maintain the parliamentary tradition and not disgrace themselves. So they attempted to answer the questions. And those answers, because they did give us answers for Trinidad Hilton and Magdalena in Tobago, those answers were very, very interesting because I was able to apply my accounting and my finance background together with colleagues and perform something called a reconstruction of accounts. Because there's a thing you do in accounting and finance where in fact you go into an organization or you go into a situation and the records have been destroyed or hidden. But you need to know what is happening in there. And there's a process we perform called a reconstruction of accounts. So you can look at how much gas they bought or how many times they ordered lunches. And how many times, what is the electricity bill? And you can figure out things about how the building was used and so on. So the things you can do. So we did certain things. And it's really quite interesting. I'll talk about that now. In the case of Trinidad Hilton, we have a situation where I would summarize. I know my time is not as much as I would like. But I would summarize. And I would say to you that Trinidad Hilton has been in Trinidad since 1962. This is Hilton International. They have 418 rooms, and we're doing a refurbishment now, started since 2008. It's supposed to cost 664 million Trinidad and Tobago dollars. Nobody knows when it will end, not even the company doing the project. One of these things that the bridge should know where, we have those things in Trinidad and Tobago too. <laughs> you know, the bridge should know any, what do you call it in America, the loop road that just goes around, yeah, like that. So Trinidad Hilton is one of those projects. And what we found is that we have to have an analysis of the figures. This is where my trading comes in. Hotel revenue is actually three streams, three broad streams are combined to make up what is called the sales revenue, which in ordinary accounting language is the turnover of the, of the facility. The three streams are accommodation. So Tom and Mary rent a, rent a room. That's accommodation. Then there's food and beverage. Betty and Philip go for dinner, food and beverage. And then thirdly, there's rentals, like functions, like conferences, weddings, cocktail parties, and so on. And sometimes sundry rentals, they have, they have shops and facilities, and so on. Those three things together add up to sales revenue, which accountants would call turnover. Interestingly, the accounts, the, the taxes paid disclosed by the parliamentarians are very interesting because Hilton are so clever. They figured out a way, and I'm saying this, they can, they, can, they can take it up if they want. Hilton are so clever. They figured out a way that the sales revenue of Hilton over the four years, there were four years that Obika asked about, was 175 million. And the room revenue was twice that, 352 million. Now that is quite simply, people, quite literally, incredible, impossible, and something resembling cooking the books. How could the room revenue be twice as much as the sales revenue? You're trying to depress the sales revenue, to depress the tax revenue to the state. 
and the actual room revenue, which is taxed separately, is twice as much as the sales revenue. And there's a very detailed analysis of this. But it's not doesn't stop there. <laughs> it doesn't stop there at all. It's interesting. In the case of Magdalena Grand, which used to be Tobago Hilton, their sales revenue is 176 million. And their room revenue is 110 million, which is all in order and makes sense. The room revenue is a subset of the sales revenue. The one cannot exceed the other. But you have to have a detailed thing about what, what the figures mean. What are the figures and what do they mean? And if you don't have a detailed thing, these multinationals could tell you anything. And I'm getting to that point. You go further in the analysis. And you look at things like there's a, a series of system of taxation we have in Trinidad and Tobago called pay as you earn, where it's what's called a statutory deduction for your wages. There's national insurance, which is a national savings and health scheme, statutory deduction from your wages. And there are personal allowances in the inland revenue, and you have to conduct an analysis of those things. When I do the paper, you get a detailed analysis of all of it, all of the equations. I don't have time for that now. Time is too short, according to the chair. But I can say, yep, I can say that the detailed analysis of Hilton's figures, which is the only one for which we have detailed figures, and the figures were very purposely manipulated by the parliamentarians. So for Magdalena Grand, we were told there was no PSU earn. We were told that there were no statutory deductions for 68 employees in a company in Trinidad and Tobago. That, that's illegal. I run a company. That's illegal. You can't do that. Well, something. It's some kind of intelligence. It's like malicious intelligence. But for Magdalena Grand, there's no PAYE, so we weren't able to conduct a corresponding analysis for Magdalena Grand. We conducted the analysis for Hilton, and I could tell you the average wage in Hilton, according to this analysis, is $24,000 a month. When you consider waitresses and waiters and people mopping the floor, it's something resembling preposterous. I will go further because I'm backing this up in detail numbers. I'll go further. When you do a comparison now, between Magdalena Grand, you do comparisons where they are possible because it's a partial reconstruction of accounts. When you do a comparison now, between Magdalena Grand, which is loss making, it loses money every year. They lost $276 million in the last nine years, according to the minister. When you do a comparison between Magdalena Grand's revenue and their wages, as estimated from the taxes, and Hilton Trinidad, which makes a profit, Magdalena's wages range from 23% to 32% of the turnover. Again, as somebody running a business, that kind of makes sense to me. Hilton's own, which is the profit-making one, right? You'd be surprised to know, ranges from 55% to 78%, which is somebody running a business is impossible. You can't be running a business and having... So how, what do they use to buy food and the supplies for the business? How, how could it be 78% of these wages? It's, it's literally ridiculous. Okay, it needs to be examined. And we need to have an intelligent examination of these numbers. So I support very much the call by the minister this morning in relation to the tourism intelligence and us understanding what is happening in these sectors. Even in a case like Barbados, because this morning's newspaper contained an announcement from the Barbados Tourism Agency, a 122-page document they put out soliciting investments in Barbados, and particularly around the downtown area. That was in this morning's newspaper. And I predict, because of the fiscal constraints on Barbados, Barbados will have to engage in a significant number of public-private partnerships. Therefore, it's important for us as a research matter of priority and responsibility to look into this matter in detail. I don't want a philosophical paper about the meaning of PPP. I want to know what's actually happening. <coughs> I read all those papers. I want to know what's really going on in this hotel and in that hotel and how much taxes that they're really paying, where are their accounts. Let's get down to the meaning of it. <laughs> the Hyatt Hotel, which is the third one, and I'm coming up to my end, is profitable. Sorry? Sure, thank you. It's a profitable hotel, according to what the politicians say. It's profitable. The burning question is what profits do we earn? Because we are, we, are, we are part of the agreement, yes? It's a public-private partnership. We put out all the capital. All of our capital is at risk. Using the PPP, 
metric to understand what we're talking about. And I will tell you all a story because it's important to get these stories about how things work and how things don't work. And sometimes something could be not be working in your face. And because of the fact that we have been, and I'm going to say it directly, we have been cultured to be economically and financially illiterate. We have been cultured that way, we've been raised that way. We don't question certain things, and that is like that, and this is like this. And, and something will be happening in front of you, and you don't see it. The Hyatt Hotel in Port of Spain was opened in January of 2008. And it became an immediate success. It was an outstanding design, five-star hotel, international name. And to be quite frank, the state owned the property, as I indicated earlier. And most of the state's functions shifted there in terms of weddings and parties and different parties and conferences and so on and so on. You would expect that kind of thing. And it was not until the 10th of June 2014, because I pay attention to these dates, we had the horror of learning from the sitting AG at the time that a situation had developed at the outset between Hyatt International and the Trinidad and Tobago government, our counterparty is called Udicott, our urban development company. And a problem had developed on our side in terms of the paperwork. Whatever the problem was, it doesn't matter. But there was a problem with how we had incorporated one company and transferred the assets to another company and some sort of problem had developed. And Hyatt was able, by invoking that problem, by invoking certain clauses in the agreement, to pay no money to Trinidad and Tobago until June of 2014. So for six and a half years, and the amount of money that was paid up when the thing was settled by international arbitration was $334 million. So for six and a half years, the place was full of people, full of business. I went there many times. And you thought you were seeing what you thought you were seeing. But because you were financially and economically illiterate, you didn't know what you were seeing. And the only way you're going to see that is to see the audits, see the accounts, and demand a proper accounting. And demand proper research, which is equal to colleagues again here, colleagues at UE and other colleagues and so on. Now, I mean, concluding here. Trinidad Hilton, there are some profits, my calculation, based on what was presented to us, and I, I'm skeptical about it. I believe it was compressed or adjusted. Some people say manipulated. 3.5% <laughs> of turnover is the rate of profit <coughs> for Hilton. And um, that was done by various accounting adjustments. Magdalena Grand, unprofitable, but there are new arrangements. That's the one in Tobago that used to be Tobago Hilton. There are new arrangements being contemplated because we were told two months ago by the Minister of Finance that an agreement was about to be signed with Apple Leisure, which is a United States-based hotelier. And Apple Leisure was coming to operate Magdalena Grand. There's 198 rooms on a golf course on the rough side of Tobago. The building is being fully refurbished yet again at our expense. I'm sure our colleague... Mr. Louis Lewis could tell us all about some more details than I know. And that is that one. And the third one is higher Regency, which profits are stated to be in about the 10% range of turnover, which is more approaching normalcy for me. We still don't know what is the return to our self as the state. Let me make some closing points here, please. The state's investment of public money is as immense as it is opaque. The amount of money we invested in this, in capital, and I did not count the land, is approaching $2 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars for a country this small. I don't know what is the target rate of return, which as far as I'm concerned, as a trained personnel, that's an absurd position to be in. I'm investing public money in a commercial enterprise. This is not a social good like a bridge or road or water supply or the education system. This is supposedly a commercial enterprise with some of the leading commercial enterprises on the planet, and I don't know what my rate of return is. I bet you that Hilton and Hyatt and them have their rate of return worked out, and they know what is their target rate of return. What is the achieved rate of return? We don't know, because we have no accounts. I want to do... I also want to say that the companies, the hotels are held in different companies, which adds to the governance problem as mentioned by my colleague Tanisha Brown when she spoke to the first lady who spoke. 
It's a serious point. So the Hilton and Magdalena are held by one company, one state enterprise. The higher is held by another one. The proposal that was recently, you, you may have heard about it, for a Tobago sandals, that was to have been held by a third one, which was supposed to be Golden Grove Baku, Baku Limited. There's a Tobago Tourism Agency, and there's a Trinidad and Tobago Tourism Limited. And I could go on, but it would start to sound like an like a old calypso or something. <laughs> I could go on, but I don't, I don't have to make up anything. This is all facts about how silly it is. And what is interesting, to back up what Tanisha was saying, is that in fact, our Companies Act does not allow information sharing. It is prohibited. If you are a director of company A, you cannot, by law, give me information on the, on the, on the decisions of company A. Unless that company is taking a very formal decision and board a resolution that you may give me these particular pieces of information. That information, by law, is secret. So these silos actually have consequences for how we run things. We need to get out of the siloed approach and get into a, a, an approach that can have greater possibility for institutional learning. There's also a question of intersectionality I talked about in relation to the Barbados prospects and the wider Caribbean prospects. So this is not just a question of us isolating Trinidad and Tobago and saying Trinidad and Tobago has money, so they build the hotels. And that is Trinidad and Tobago over there. From these few exchanges, we can learn that there's a benefit to studying these matters in some detail. There's a decision matrix I want to propose. I don't have any PowerPoint. I'll propose a decision matrix to you. And it's going to be the pith of the question. And the decision matrix is this. The private sector that is involved in these public-private partnerships, the hoteliers, they, they have a target rate of return and they have proper accounts. Because you could be running Hilton in some part of the world and don't be giving them accounts every month and every quarter. You'll be fired. In Trinidad and Tobago, you'll be running a state enterprise for 10 years and 15 years and there's no accounts and everything is good and you have the cocktail party shaking the prime minister's hand and all kinds of nonsense. You'll be fired. And the standard for the accounting and management of public money is that public money is to be accounted for and managed at a higher standard than private money. This, this is inescapable logic. This is outrageous taking place here. Independence has to have a meaning. And the point I'm making is that if the private companies were losing money or they were making less than a target rate of return, they'd be gone. No multinational is sitting down to swallow all losses in a black country. Let us say it straight. They're not there for that. When they went to Tobago and they were losing money, they invoked clause X, Y, and Z, and they were gone. So now we have Magdalene, and now we're going to have Apple something, something just now. They're not sitting down there to swallow any losses with any black country. They're not there for that. They're there to make money on our back. And we have to be aware of it. So therefore, they are making their target rate of return, or they are exceeding it. That's a reasonable inference on the information, thanks. On the other side, from our point of view, if we were making money as a state, given the political leadership we have in the country, irrespective of the political tic-tac-toe, it will be a matter of pride to be boasting about it. You say, may they boast about Carl. Carl made 121 million. They were talking about it for the last three weeks. They'd be talking about it. But they're not talking about that at all. So we're not making money. So we have to be very reasonable about the information and decide we're not making money. There's a constitutional question here as well. I'm, with, I'm closing off with two points, Chair, and that's it. 60 seconds. There's a constitutional question here as well. We take public land. We take public money. We invest vast quantities of them to create these facilities, supposedly in the public benefit. And when we ask detailed questions, I'm not interested in any Nancy story. I want details about what you are doing with my business. You can't tell me that because it's private. That's the defense under the Freedom of Information Act. It's commercial, it's confidential, it's private. You cannot take public money. You cannot take public man, land and conduct yourself privately. That's the constitutional issue before us as colleagues. And finally, I think the research case for us to do serious research into this is a solid one and needs proper consideration. So I thank you for your time, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you.